Uh, my name is Stephen Weil. I'm a debate coach here at Emory University, and I'm going to talk to you all about impact comparison or impact calculus. Uh, impact comparison is an important part of debate um, for a couple of reasons. Um, most basically, it's about explaining to the judge why they should care more about your arguments than about the other team's arguments. Um, and from a strategic level, it often serves as a way for judges to decide otherwise very close debates. Um, it's hard for judges to be debate robots and calculate that there's exactly a 32% risk of this and an 80% risk of this, and so when they have kind of gut feelings of, well, the AF argument seems okay, the NEG argument seems okay, impact calculus is an important way to kind of serve as a tiebreaker for which one to care more about. So when you're thinking about doing impact comparison, there are generally three categories or pillars around which you center um, that discussion. Uh, the first is magnitude, which is literally just the size of the impact, um, a straightforward way of thinking about it. And generally in debate terms, when we're talking about the size, we're talking very much just about the number of people that would be affected. So if the negative is talking about global warming and the affirmative is talking about a conflict in the South China Sea, the negative might say that global warming has a larger magnitude because you know, crop failures and sea level rises will affect people around the globe where a South China Sea conflict might stay local and affect only those countries uh, regionally. So that's category one. Uh, the second category to think about is time frame, um, which is when will the kind of terminal consequence happen. Um, something like global warming is obviously happening now, but a lot of the catastrophic impact that might be described wouldn't occur for years, if not decades. So it's an impact that is big, but generally has a longer time frame. Um, conflict scenarios are often things that might be more short term. A conflict in Syria is happening now. It could escalate, um, you know, any time. A conflict in the South China Sea could occur in the next year or so, um, you know, according to some evidence. So those impacts will often have faster time frames, and that's another way of comparing um, your advantages. The final category is probability, um, which is a little tricky. On face, it's just the likelihood that the impact will happen, but it's important to kind of separate this from the rest of the arguments that are being made in the debate. When you're talking about the probability of your impact, you're talking just about the probability that that sort of end consequence manifests. Like, how likely is it that tension in the South China Sea will actually lead to a war, as opposed to how likely is it that the AF solves their South China Sea advantage? Because remember that impact calculus is often used kind of as the tiebreaker in scenarios when the arguments are otherwise close in likelihood. So you don't want to be talking about the, all of the arguments in the debate. I'll often hear a debater be like, our disads of high probability because we won the link. And that kind of conflates the purpose of impact calculus. Um, final couple of categories. One very important part of impact comparison is to talk about reasons why the disad turns the case or the case turns the disad, which is a way of saying that you should identify possible interactions between your different impacts or ways that yours might cause theirs or make it harder to solve. Um, in the example that I've kind of been using, you could say that global warming would generate more propensity for resource conflicts as you know, water dries up and people run out of food as crop yields fail along those lines, which could make wars more likely, including in the South China Sea. So global warming could turn South China Sea conflict. On the flip side, you could say that a South China Sea conflict would undermine the ability for the US and China to cooperate on implementing climate agreements, which would make it harder to solve global warming. Um, so there's possible interactions in both directions. Um, it's a good idea, this is something before a debate, that it's easy to kind of sit around and brainstorm. You'll often know what kind of argument you want to go for on the negative. Um, think about, you know, the AF advantages that they're going to read and ways that you could identify different possible interactions. If you have a diversity of these arguments, then even if the AF can answer one, um, you can still have other turns case arguments. So it's always good to think of as many of these as you can, you know, two or three per debate is often a good thing to aim for. On the flip side, the app should be doing the same thing and think about ways that you can use your advantage to complicate the disad impact or access it. The final thing 
is you shouldn't try and make your impact always be bigger and faster and more likely. You know, if you could, that's great, and you'll probably win, but most impacts won't be higher magnitude and higher probability and faster time frame. You should think about kind of which category you're most ahead in or what aspect of your impact is best and find ways to emphasize why the judge should care more about that category. So a couple of examples, if your impact was of greater magnitude, um, you know, something like a nuclear war that risks nuclear winter or a global warming that could potentially disrupt all life on the planet, um, and it's, you know, an existential impact, one that risks all of humanity, people will often say that you should prefer that because even if it's of lower probability, if it kills all people and all future people, then it's a, an impact of infinite size and any percent chance of infinity is infinity. And that's kind of a logic drawn from um, a nuclear disarm activist from the Cold War named Jonathan Schell, but people now just kind of use that idea and there are other um, philosophers of risk that talk about that concept as a reason to prefer high magnitude impacts. On the flip side, you might have an impact that's of lower magnitude but is much higher probability. Something that's structural or systemic like poverty or sexual violence um, that is definitively happening, it's 100% probability, but it doesn't risk human extinction so it seems, quote, smaller. Um, so you want to kind of flip some of that logic on its head if you want to emphasize a high probability impact and say that the kind of logic of 1% of infinity is infinity kind of causes a continual distraction of reacting to low probability crises instead of dealing with important structural issues. Um, finally, you know, if your impact is of quicker time frame, you might want to emphasize the idea of, um, you know, dealing with the, the impact that's going to happen first. So people will often use the phrase, live to fight another day. Um, particularly if you have good turns case arguments for why your impact interacts with theirs. If yours happens first, you might say something like, well, yes, global warming is a big impact, but we have several decades to deal with that. If we don't resolve US-China relations in the short term and the potential for conflict, we'll never be able to solve it. So you should prefer deal with the quicker thing first so that we can then move on and address the other team's impact. So those are some ways of thinking about how to compare your impacts and how to give the judges good reasons to care more about your arguments than the other teams.